Good afternoon to you, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It is the first day of September. Cue the, uh, the Green Day song, right? You all know it. Um, it always rings in my head every time I think about September. Um, so here we are. I'm back home in North Carolina in Wilmington after a heck of a 12 days on the road. You know, I spent 12 days on the road last year for Dorian. So it's the same again this year. Long road trips to capture data and um, see what hurricanes are doing, you know, share the impacts, all that kind of stuff. Met a lot of great people, worked with a lot of great people, and man, am I tired. I got to get some rest, and then it's going to be right back at it, I do believe, at least from discussing things and maybe getting ready for some landfalls. You never know. We got a long way to go. Hurricane season is here. We're in the thick of it. We're almost to the peak time. And with water temperatures the way they are, I think this is going to drag on through the month of October easily. So speaking of that, let's start with a look at the sea surface temperature anomalies. This gives us a great literal base map of where to start and how to uh, understand where we are in the season and where we have to go. First of all, anomalies are departures from normal. And when you talk about um, a little bit of extra uh, heat in the ocean, maybe a half a degree Celsius warmer, or you have a little bit of, of less heat, a half a degree Celsius cooler. In a small area, as I've talked about before, maybe a cup of water or even your bathtub, you really wouldn't notice much of a difference. But the amount of energy that we are talking about when you add or subtract heat from the ocean, especially the vastness of the oceans here, the Atlantic Basin, the Pacific, if you add and remove heat even in a quarter or half a full degree Celsius, two or three degrees Fahrenheit, more or less, it adjusts the amount of energy available in the water substantially. And heat is energy, all right? And it fuels, in this case, the heat, the latent heat, released from the oceans into the lower atmosphere. That energy is trapped as latent heat. Hurricanes tap into that and release that energy in the atmosphere through condensation. Condensation is a warming process that warms the atmosphere around the hurricane. It disrupts the ocean, churns up the water, and you get these cold wakes, like you see in the wake of Marco and Lara right there. Um, hurricanes don't necessarily move heat from here up to here. They don't take the heat out so much as they disperse the heat in the ocean to kind of churn all that up, and it lowers ocean temperatures where these hurricanes were. And we can see that very effectively in the Pacific here where we had Genevieve and Hernan, I think it was, and Isel. And then in the uh, Gulf, of course, we just had Marco and Laura. But look at the anomaly here in the Gulf. I mean, my goodness, it came into southwest Louisiana, Laura did. Right there is landfall. And the water temperatures are still above the long-term average. I mean, wow, that just shows you how potent the Gulf of Mexico is that you can bring a Cat 4 through there. And this is updated just yesterday. It's always a day behind. Um, and there's just not much of a, of a cold wake left from Marco and Laura. So that's something to keep in mind. Not trying to scare you or upset you, but we got to be real about it and be on our toes. What else do we notice? The La Nina shaping up here, very cold relative to average uh, in the Pacific, this La Nina pattern. And in the Atlantic, the very warm main development region all the way across the very warm subtropics here. Uh, it's not going to just end at the end of September. I think we're going to go on through October and maybe even have some November threats, which are usually focused on the Caribbean. So we've got a long way to go. We've got to stay on top of it. We have to be ready. and We've got to pull together and um, use our intelligence to try to survive all of this, the onslaught here from Mother Nature. Um, we might not completely, you know, get by unscathed, but we can use our technology and our foresight here to at least be better aware. The upper ocean heat content, now here is where uh, Laura removed some energy. Uh, the upper ocean heat content values definitely lower all through here uh, because of Laura. You can see that area right there where it's just chiseled out. But the actual ocean temperatures in there, we can look at that through the Gulf imagery here, the actual ocean temperatures, this green color that I will highlight in, uh, let's do violet. These green colors all through here, you know, we see that the upper ocean heat content's taken out, but we're still talking 29 and a half 
almost 30 degrees Celsius, it's still plenty warm, make no mistake about it. So Laura came in and turned things up, uh, but there's still plenty of warm water. Colder here relative to average, um, south of the Panhandle and out in the Central Gulf. But just because you see blue doesn't mean that it's cold. If you look at the legend, blue, even the darker blue and purple, I mean, it even says it right there. There's your isotherm, 28 Celsius, you know, about that dividing line there. We're still talking 82, 83 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if you go back and you check the upper ocean heat content, oh yeah, there is plenty of it available all in the western basin, all around the islands down here, and that extends up the southeast coast, uh, right up to the coastline here, the Carolinas and Florida. So we got a ways to go, people. We really, really do. You got to just don't put those hurricanes, you know, oh, Laura's it, that's it. And we don't have a hurricane out there now, so there's probably not going to be any more. You can't think that way. You got to think, I'm staying on top of this until it's November and it's over. And hopefully by then it really will be over. There's only so much we can take, right? Um, so water temperatures off the mid-Atlantic and southeast, nice and warm. This is 29 degrees Celsius. This is 28 Celsius. Uh, I fully intend to get down to the beach with my kids uh, in the next few days. I've been away for too long and the water temperatures are nice and warm. So that's all still there, very much in the wheelhouse of you know, where we can get intense hurricanes. Uh, real quick, in the eastern Pacific, not much going on here, 10%, whatever, no big deal. That's good. We've escaped major impacts from Mexico, including the Baja Peninsula. We've had some impacts, but no big, powerful hurricanes just yet, and that is good news. In the Atlantic, not the same. We just had Laura that made landfall. Laura is, I believe, the sixth uh, landfalling tropical cyclone to make to strike the United States this year. We've had six, and um, we've had three hurricanes. We had uh, Hannah down here, and then Isaias up here, and then now Laura here, Laura Category Four. Wow, you know, already, and it's only September first. Uh, we knew this was coming as much as we could possibly know. And in that regard, let me just say this. On one hand, the only good that's coming out of this is that you can trust the science. And that is extremely important in this day and age and all that that implies. Seriously, trusting the science. I, among others, have seen this pattern setting up since March and April, and here it is now. The West African monsoon being very strong the anomalously warm water temperatures in the Atlantic, the cooling of the tropical Pacific, that La Nina pattern. Dr. Klotzbach at Colorado State University, Ben Knoll, Jack Sillen, Eric Webb, and others, myself, even, you know, just, quote, weather geeks that are out there following this stuff passionately, we all knew. We all knew. We saw the pattern there. It's just like watching sports when a certain play comes together and you know that team is going to punch through the defense and either score a touchdown or get an open shot to the basket if it's basketball. Whatever the case is, you recognize the pattern, you recognize the play, and the play leads to something happening. And in this case, the weather. And these are literally, look at it. It couldn't be a better analogy. You got X's and you got O's. It's X's and O's, everybody. Plain and simple. Um, and so here it is, right? And we got to, you know, Two months left of the peak months, September and October. <sighs> Take a deep breath, Mark. So what do we got? Well, TD15, not going to be an issue. Probably will not develop into a named storm. It will generate a little bit of swell activity that will come out towards the coast up here. So please be mindful of that. Even swells and high surf can cause problems. Uh, so please just don't ignore that. Then we have Nana down here, just to the southwest of Jamaica. And this is a small tropical storm forecast to make landfall now in Belize as a hurricane. And because this is small, and because I also forgot to pull up a zoomed in satellite, we'll embellish a little bit and improvise while we work on this. Uh, because it is small, the core will be much more apt, if that's a word, to, I don't know, like ramping up quickly, but it could also wind down just as quickly. So as I correct my mistake here and zoom into this so we can get a good floater, I like it when I create it myself. Come on, work with me. Um, 
I know that they have floaters that I can click on, but I like it customized. So, uh, this being a small system means that it can ramp up very quickly. And the other good thing, the, the good thing about it being small too, is it's just a small area overall. But the bad thing is it's going to be passing over some high upper ocean heat content. And we can see that right here. Nana going to pass generally over this area right through here. So that small core might have the opportunity to really ramp up before landfall and become a compact but fairly ferocious um, cyclone, tropical cyclone. So please keep that in mind if you have interest in Belize. Um, this could come up very quickly. We're going to watch this closely. Uh, and hats off to the weathernerds.org um, code folks that made all this possible. I love that you can just create your custom zoom. That works for me. I really like it. You notice a couple things of note. Uh, the outflow extended out over this way. It's moving into a favorable area. It looks like the outflow is going to improve. So we'll see these small systems, they can be problematic and, and then they ramp up really quickly. Looking at the larger picture here, boy, I tell you, it's just, wow, it's a good thing we're in kind of a suppressed phase of a Kelvin wave right now. It's not completely ideal out there because you can see as well as I can, a tremendous amount of moisture and energy stretched out all across the deep tropics. The good news is there's a little bit of dry air still out here coming off the African coast. Uh, that dry mid-level air helps to put a cap on things. And there, there's other factors at play that right now we're not looking at a unhinged pattern where everything can go and we're going to have five hurricanes at once. We're not there. And that's good. It's funny, I talked about TD-15 not really doing much. And there it is trying to flare up. So who knows, right? Maybe that becomes Tropical Storm Omar. Uh, but a lot of energy out there to watch. And you know, as I talk about, here's another way to look at all of that energy. And you kind of boil it down. We'll say, all right, well, here's this system here. That is Nana, and it's bundled pretty well. There's TD-15, definitely bundled pretty well. Um, some other disturbances in and, in and around the tropical Atlantic. But all of that energy is generally spread out. So you see how that is? You look at the satellite, you go, ooh, it's a lot out there. Well, when you look below the clouds and sort of through the clouds and look at the structure, what does the meat and potatoes of it look like, so to speak, right? Or something like that. And that's what this vorticity shows us. Stretched out, stretched out. But will any one of these bundle up and take off? That is the question. And we just don't know. We can turn to guidance like the ECMWF. This is the Euro. Uh, and this is the same exact part of the atmosphere as this. Uh, 850 millibars up, about 5,000 feet, and it is the cyclonic vorticity. You can see that right there. So this is the model's interpretation of the analysis um, from 8 o'clock this morning, and there's all of our energy. Let me draw on it where you can see it. There's all of our energy out here in the Atlantic. There's the teeny tiny vorticity signature of um, Nana, and then here is TD-15. So let's move this out in 24 hour increments and we see what happens. It really jumps on Nana there. Very small, the global model picking that up like that. And Jack Sillen, and he's one of our new contributors, he'd tell you, when these global models see something tightening up like that, you should take notice. And I'm a little concerned that you folks down in Belize could be dealing with maybe a 100 mile per hour hurricane or it just never gets itself together and it stays a, a weak tropical storm. Those little systems, yeah, you just never know. But at 24 hours out, the Euro kind of picking up on it there. 48 hours, it's inland, coming inland right over Belize. Um, and again, that could really ramp up and be a small core, five or 10 miles across, not much, but don't be surprised if it ramps up. Elsewhere in the tropical Atlantic, Big pieces of energy coming off. Got to watch these as we get through September. This is day three, day four. And look what happens. By the way, by 72 hours, there is an impulse now moving into the Northeast Caribbean. So our followers down there, um, Daniela in Antigua, um, Mirko over in St. Bart's, Tim down in St. Thomas, and many, many others that we have. These are folks that just come to top of mind because I talk to them frequently on social media. You got some weather coming your way, probably not a storm or anything, not a named storm, but who cares? 
It's going to be gusty winds. I say, who cares? I mean, I know there's a big difference between an Irma and a tropical wave, and you do too. But my point is, do not ignore these tropical waves. And it looks like by 72 hours, there will be a pretty decent amplifying small wave with some vigor, right? It's got some spunk with it. So be ready for that uh, by Friday morning is when that looks like it's going to be moving through. And then eventually towards Puerto Rico. So Carlos, over in Puerto Rico, get ready. It's over you by Saturday. And then maybe more activity trying to brew. You can see the Euro fighting between that vorticity center and the one to the north, but a large pocket of energy nevertheless by day five, six, seven. We'll look at seven days on this one. The potential at this point for one, two, three named storms on September 8th is on the table. Wow. And it's only September 8th. We got a long way to go. But at least for now, no major issues for land areas, and even Nana, if it ramps up quickly, will be small, so a very small area. But anybody watching in Belize, please take that um, seriously. You know how these things can jump up really quick. I think it was Keith or something like that that was down there a number of years ago. You just never know with these systems when they're tiny like that. You can get a violent hurricane coming in, and it falls apart very quickly as soon as it makes landfall. That whole process gets disrupted like that, whereas something like Laura, with a much larger core, takes a much longer period of time to die out. Uh, so at least the pattern is not too threatening overall. We know it could certainly be worse. All right, so big announcement today. Uh, us and the Hurricane Tracker app folks have, um, as they say, signed. Um, is it too early in Jack's career to call him a legend? We've signed a great, this is like signing Kobe Bryant, all right? And you think I'm joking. It's not, I mean, really, or Kyrie Irving or whoever, you know? Seriously, Jack Sillen is going to be, he's probably just dying, going to be blushing. His parents are going to, I know how it is because he's the same age as my number two son. My second uh, son, his name is Cole, and he's the same age as Jack. Cole is going to school for medicine at UNC, Jack is at Cornell for meteorology, atmospheric science, etc. Anyway, we have, as they say, signed Jack Sillen as, as, uh, as, if I just, I got so much to say, as have the people uh, at Hurricane Tracker app. You know that app, very popular. Um, and so Jack's going to be contributing and reaching a lot of people. And that is the beauty of social media. And um, we are very excited about having Jack. What is he going to do? First and foremost, if you are a patron, a supporter, a crowd funder of our Patreon, Jack will be posting a blog every morning on a consistent basis. Something that has been more and more difficult over the years for me to do, not because I'm getting older and I'm you know, not able to, but because I've gotten busier. I cannot do this by myself. And I've always dreamed of growing it into adding more people. And I've been working with Greg Nordstrom since 2011, off and on, this year. And he's from Mississippi State University. He's an instructor there. He's going to be doing more with us than ever before. Finally able to do that. Jack Sillen will literally be a contributing, almost like a staff member. We've got more help coming in because, my goodness, I have needed it. So... Jack will be posting these blogs on Patreon, and then about 15 to 30 minutes later, somewhere in there, he will post that on social media, and it'll go out to everyone. So just a little incentive if you're a patron or you're thinking about becoming a patron and you want to have the first access to stuff, you know, being first sometimes means a lot. And that's one of the perks of being a supporter of our work here on Patreon. So big welcome here from Jack. You can see the annotated graphics that he does. I don't have time to do these things. I don't. He does. Um, and we are really excited about having him involved. It's going to be in-depth, but easy to understand as well. And he and I will be able to work with each other. Look at the comments from our patrons. Wow. So this is a big benefit. If you want to become uh, a supporter of our work on Patreon, that is part of the package overall. Uh, and that's only at the $10, that's actually at any level, honestly, a dollar or up. 
um, if I can get my internet to cooperate. So even for a dollar, you know, say just a dollar, if everybody contributed a dollar that's watching this video, pff, we'd be we'd be good. We would be good to go. Um, the $10, $25 levels have different tiers and different benefits. We are growing something that is going to change online weather coverage as we know it. I promise you that. It's starting from hurricanes where I came from, and I'm going to grow that. I've been a weather geek all my life, and you can only imagine if I take the passion and the innovation and my ideas with all these youngsters coming up, and even the oldsters, as it were, people my age, um, it's just crazy that I'm old enough to be his father, but it works well, doesn't it? And we're so excited about it. We're going to do a lot with this. Make sure you check out the video that I did earlier today called uh, Crowdfunding Announcement or something like that. We are on a crusade. I'm going to just tell you a little quick, real quick thing. To get as many of these little drop sensors as we can get our hands on from Kestrel. Um, they're about $115 to $130 each. And the idea is that we're going to have a whole bunch of these, hopefully several dozen. And we're going to give them to people when we go into a hurricane area. Give them a little card, show them how to operate it, what to do. It's very, very simple. And they're going to use their smartphone when it's over. They put these in their house, they evacuate, or maybe they're in an area where they don't have to evacuate. You keep this with you, and we're going to create the largest crowd-sourced, crowd-funded pressure study of a major hurricane at landfall, and I want it to be this season. So get on the ball. Look at that other video. You know you know how to find me, hurricanetrack.com, my email, whatever. Um, and if you want to purchase one of these, you want to purchase a box of them. You know, you want to purchase a hundred of them for us. There's people out there that have the means to do it. And we're going to give this data away for free. We're not making a, a profit off of this data at all. We want to be able to give it away to the science community, to uh, university, the weather service, you guys. Crowdsource it, crowdfund it. Pressure data is extremely important. And we're launching that officially as of today. We learned a lot from Laura. I'm going to show you that. Oh my goodness, what we're going to be able to do from here, apply it to winter storms, those big bomb cyclones, the ones that come into the Pacific Northwest, do this in the Philippines, over uh, in the UK when you get these hurricanes that go across. They name storms in the North uh, East Atlantic off the North Sea. Well, that's the North Sea, it's not the Atlantic, but I'm, I'm excited. You can tell. Can you tell? I think you can. All right, so that's how you get involved. We're crowdfunding it. Patreon.com slash hurricane track. And even the graphic there. Kari over in the UK. I don't have to make these graphics. It saves me from having to struggle with that. Oh, thank you all so much. It's awesome. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of something absolutely extraordinary. Help make it grow. Be a part of it one way or the other. Great having you on the other side of the screen watching at the very least. I love it. I'll talk to you again tomorrow.